Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 89th episode of the Manor Podcast. I'm your co-host, Roger Bodie, joined as always with my best friend and other co-host, Michael Hamilton. Michael, you're not a, you, you're, you, you've still never seen Star Wars, right? You're not a Star Wars player. Well, I guess you're playing the new Star Wars Unlimited, but you still haven't sat down and actually like, watched the movies, right? Yeah, now that I have, I think, three-ish hours of playtime in Star Wars Unlimited, I have played much more Star Wars than I've watched Star Wars. So, I think that means now that Austin has officially sat down and watched more Star Wars content than you have. <laughs> so when I was a, a boy, when I was a lad, uh, I had this little Darth Vader coin bank, and basically you could either press a button or whenever you put a little like piggy bank coin inside of it, Darth Vader would animate and light up and go, poof, poof, and do <laughs> Darth Vader things and wave a lightsaber around. And my parents visited two weekends ago, and they're like, here, have your old Darth Vader piggy bank. It's like covered in dust and stuff like that. So I like clean it off and put batteries in it. And Austin watches it go off, and he is now obsessed with darth vader he's like where did if he if he if it's not around he's like where did vader go where did vader go i want it where Aww. i want vader and <laughs> he just he just non-stop vader so i sat down with him after putting vader away i was like let's watch some vader and i just turned on like a darth vader snippet series of it which i don't know how good it was because darth vader did kill some people but you know <laughs> hmm. At least it's like Star Wars killing people where like they just fly off the screen or something like that. You know, it's very, it's very PG dying. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm not familiar with uh, Star Wars deaths as you would, know, as you know. <laughs> yeah. Like there's so. no like blood or gore or anything like that. It's just like, I think the goriest thing that I remember in Star Wars maybe was like Darth Maul in episode one getting chopped to like. Oh no, episode three, you actually see Anakin like lit on fire and like burning alive. I think that's the goriest one, but we didn't watch that. Jeez. No spoiler warnings or anything <laughs> on this 30 year old movie. Yeah, older than 30 <laughs> at this point. I mean, uh, you knew. Three? Three's older than? Or episode three? Well, you know three. what happened to Anakin all, all the way in like the 1980s Empire Strikes Back or whatever. You learned that Darth Vader was Anakin Skywalker and stuff, so. Okay. <laughs> so we're doing a Star Wars Unlimited no, I'm really episode not now. watching it. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. I like, uh, I don't even remember her name. The one that taps to gain a life. I played two games of that <laughs> game. I have no idea. And it was a draft, so it wasn't even like constructed or anything. Yeah. No, not st we're not talking about Star Wars Unlimited. Fair enough. We're what are we going to talk about today then? We're going to talk about equipment in Flesh and Blood. Okay. What kind of equipment? After we shout out the Realm Games, our sponsor. Yeah, the Realm Games, our sponsor. <laughs> we're very used to doing this by now and have a total script that we're going to read off of right now. There's no script. I don't, they, they, yeah. This is very freeform. They're basically just like letting us vibe it out at the at this point in time. And... Uh, that that definitely works because Michael and I are very much vibe kind of guys. So I, yeah, I definitely expected you to start reading something that you had typed up because I knew you were typing some notes before we started recording, and I was like, oh, that was what he was typing up. <laughs> oh, I was typing out like what we're going to talk about. I was looking up that the Realm Games is also having a brawl in New Jersey on July twentieth coming up. It is going to be class constructed, and it's going to be all kinds of great, amazing ways to qualify for their 50K at the end of the year. So that, uh, tickets are available for purchase April 15th. So come on, everybody. Come to New Jersey, and let's go brawl. Ooh, you're a natural at <laughs> ad reads. That's not even a re read. Yeah, this, is, this is all off the top <laughs> of the dome. I did read the date off the screen. But uh, that's that's okay. about all I did. That is an important one to get right. You probably don't want to just uh, guesstimate that one. Yeah, it's, yeah, just it's some happening sometime. Just show up to New Jersey <laughs> sometime in July and find a way to compete in this brawl event. That's probably the best way to handle it, I would think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
So thank you, Realm Games, for sponsoring this episode and making content like this possible in the Flesh and Blood community. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ready to move on to equipment? So equipment, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, where, where were we? The, the, it's a question. type of card in Flesh and Blood, I would assume. Oh, yes. So equipment. You get four slots for equipment in the game of Flesh and Blood. You get your hat, your chest, your gloves, and your shoes. Offhand. And believe it or not. Offhand. No, no one no one uses offhand equipment. Those aren't real. We don't talk about them. Stalagmite okay, you... rampart. <laughs> Stalagmite's <laughs> rotated for now until it rotates back in when they give us another Steel ice guard. Steel braid buckler. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Anyway, so there's a couple more slots, I guess. Sometimes, depending on your hero. But anyway, believe it or not, equipment is very important for what heroes are good and bad. And also, they significantly affect how your heroes play. True. So what piece of equipment <laughs> do you want to talk about first? The most controversial yeah. one lately, the scapskin leathers? Uh, I was going to kind of break it down into categories, but if you want to just jump into scapskin leathers, I love uh, scapskin leathers. Okay, well, so what category would you put scapskin leathers in then? So I think... There's like equipment that is mainly used for its block value. And then there's equipment that is like, it's like utility that just like does something to like generate value or use it to generate value. And I think Scabskins, it's primarily used for its block value. And you probably wouldn't play it if it didn't block. And you probably would still play it if it had, if it didn't have this ability, but it still blocked two and one. But I would, I would say the ability is very impactful. True. So it's somewhere. A extra action points are good. Yeah. Yeah. So it's somewhere between just the blocking fridge piece of equipment and an equipment that has a lot of has utility on it. Yeah. And I guess at a high level, real quick, we'll just go over what the different pieces of equipment are supposed to represent. So head pieces are card manipulation, like drawing cards, arsenal manipulation, things like that. Uh, chest pieces are usually for resource manipulation, so find all spring tunic making resources. But then you also have cards like Deep Blue or uh, Flame Scale Furnace that generate resources through other uh, ways. Uh, arm pieces are usually for power or damage manipulation, so you have things that usually just buff power or things that could even generate rune chant damage, like um, Grasp of the Arc Knight or Metacarpus nodes also pushing arcane damage so that's usually what those um that that's what slot represents and then shoes are usually action point manipulation so usually going fast and getting you some kind of extra action points that way so that's why scapskin leathers in their extra action point generation through the dice rolling is slotted into the the, the foot or shoe slot of the game yeah, sometimes they make you go real fast. Sometimes they, they make you trip and fall. Sometimes but... you go get real sleepy, sleepy brute. No, that's a that's a different thing. That's that's when you get your arm back when Azalea sleep darts you. Uh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, so I guess I talked a lot about scab skins in the episode that we talked about our decks for the Pro Tour that didn't actually air, but. I will re talk about Skyskin Leathers. I think it's an equipment that is very frequently misevaluated. There's a lot of spots in the game where um, there was actually a good Twitter thread about this. I think Tark. Uh, yeah, Tark Patel posted about it. And it all started when James White said you shouldn't be rolling scabs because there's something I don't remember exactly what the tweet was, but it was something like that. They're usually activated too much in a game of flesh and blood. I think yeah which I strongly disagree with I think they're usually activated too little and I think I posted that in the thread but anyway uh Tarek Patel did a really good write-up that if you want to dive deeper into this after I kind of like summarize it and say my little spiel you should go look up his post on Twitter but basically every time you activate scab skins beforehand you should be doing an EV calculation where you're deciding how much value EV you're stands for expected value yes or you're seeing how much value you will get on the turn if you roll one um, versus if you roll two or three, which two or three is almost always the same as not rolling. I don't really know a situation where it would be different than not rolling. Maybe your opponent has gambler's gloves and they might try to force you to re-roll into a one or something, but essentially it's the same as not rolling. And then uh, the value that you'll get for a four, four or five, and then the value you'll get for a six. 
And a lot of the times four, five, and six are all going to be the same, but sometimes the third action point you can actually make use of. And you want to take all these values and basically take what the expected value is by averaging them. So if you roll one, what's the value of your turn? Probably zero. Or well, I guess the, whatever you value arsenaling your card. Maybe you're arsenaling like a red bear thing. So that's probably worth something to arsenal that. Or maybe you have a windup that you can discard if you roll a zero. So you should factor that. If you roll zero and you have a have a windup, you're not actually getting zero value out of your whole hand. You're getting two or whatever. <laughs> um, if you roll a four or five, you can figure out the value that your hand will get with the extra action point. If you roll six, then you can do that. And then you add it all up and then you divide by six. And that's the expected value in terms of uh, like value in the game. But there's also spots in the game where potentially you are 100% to win the game if you just have one action point this turn. And if that's the case, you shouldn't roll shoes because you introduce a chance of losing the game when you're 100% to win. Or there's also the alternative where if you don't have two action points, you can never win the game. Maybe Prism's Arc Light Sentinel looping you with the Angel of Rebirth, where basically if you never get a second action point, you're never going to bring out a loop and you're going to lose. So even if numbers-wise, it is not correct to roll in terms of just raw value, you're, it, you, you should still roll because it's the only way of winning the game. Or And this is kind of what Tarek's article, not article, post-tweet talks about is that you should be looking at it in terms of EV or expected chance of winning the game based on each outcome, which I think for most of the game, just the raw value that you'll get from the cards is an accurate representation of that. But towards the end of the game where you know you're like strongly advantaged or strongly disadvantaged, or you're in really weird board states where if you roll one, you could be in weird amount of trouble or it could just not be that bad for you because your opponent, maybe your opponent's really bad at using five card hands. And if you roll one, then you just give up five card hand. For example, I played against Great Axe Dorinthia at the Pro Tour, and I was rolling Scabskins almost every turn because the the penalty of rolling a one, it's it's not that big. And I did roll one that game. They pitched three cards to tackle me with a Great Axe and put a Sigil. So they got seven points of value out of their hand when I rolled a one, which didn't really matter. So I think that's basically it for scavskins though you should also be doing these calculations before you make blocking decisions where maybe you can just block for three value with the card and that should be added into or that should be part of the calculation for if you shouldn't roll scavskins you just block with your extra cards and just get value from them like that like guaranteed value my eyes are glazing over at this point it's so much math it's like the mathiest math that's ever been mathed on the podcast so far or a very long time yeah well i did a lot of ko testing for the pro tour and then proceeded to make a lot of mistakes with the pro tour and not do very well but i thought about scapsons a lot yeah uh so if i'm going to sit down at a table and do a bunch of math in my head in ev calculations i'm going to go play poker because the expected value of me going and doing well at a poker table if i do these calculations and know things is way higher than if i sit down at a flesh and blood table and do a bunch of expected value calculations and spoiler alert i don't like sitting down at a table and doing a bunch of expected value calculations i like sitting down at a table and having fun uh which maybe to some people <laughs> that is but it's not to me and uh i, I was gonna say I've seen you play poker. There's no EV calculation. There's going no. on there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I played some poker at the, after nationals and uh, there were very little EV calculations at that, that table as well, but it was a, it was a grand old time. Let me tell you. Um, so yeah, you just get, you just kind of play with your heart, you know, a good poker player, true poker players play with their heart, not their mind. Yeah, trust in the heart of the card, something, something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yugi Moto taught me all he, all he needed to know about card games when I was eight. So thank you very much. Yeah, I wonder if that's why I appear to be so lucky. I'm not actually lucky. I'm just taking the things that the outcome, the bad outcomes are less bad and the good outcomes are more good. So like, it just appears that I'm luckier. Could be. Maybe that's why <laughs> I appear so much unluckier because I'm just doing the things that it's so much more likely to not happen. You're just taking the bad gambles, you know? Yeah, I can't believe I didn't hit my straight flush on the river, Michael. What are the odds? Don't tell me the odds. But what are the odds? <laughs> 
about 46 out of 47 or something, 45 out of 46, or something like that. No, no, no. It's 50, 50, either it happens or it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I lost a coin flip. That's how math works. <laughs> Anytime you don't win the lottery, you lost your coin flip. Very unlucky. Yeah. It's, yeah I, I'm the world's unluckiest person ever, I think at this point. So, oh, well. So yeah, I like Skeptian Leathers. I like what they do for the game. I like that there is some variance that's built into the card inherently, but ultimately good players like Michael Hamilton could sit down at a table and to do a bunch of math and still get more value out of them than somebody who's just we for fun rolling them like me when I play Skeptian Leathers. So yeah, it seems like a sweet card and I'm glad it exists. Uh, I think really, I think maybe the thing that might push it too far is the fact that it does block so well, the three block, but you know, it was a welcome to Wraith card. They didn't know about <laughs> blocking back then. <laughs> wow. Shots fired. I, I actually think I do agree that Scapskins is like a very skill testing card and like the, the way that better players utilize it will be like higher value than I guess like other people that are rolling in spots they shouldn't or not rolling in spots they should. I don't love the design of the card. I think that card games intrinsically have enough variance in them that you don't need to just add dice rolling mechanics to it too, but that's okay. That's okay. That's the direction that I think, I think that's like something that I personally would have preferred, but I want the game to be in the best spot it is. And if that's the direction it's got to go, that's the direction it's got to go, you know? So any, any other thoughts before we move off of scaps and leathers then? Uh, I probably won't dive th- that deep into any of the other equipment. Scabson's Others is the one that I've been playing a lot of attention to. But if we do talk about Scowling Fleshback, that one might get a little little rant too. <laughs> we can we can do that one. But first, all, but let's start with a different hat though. I'm gonna I'm gonna spring this on you. I think completely uh, out of the blue because it just popped into my head. And somebody, I think it was Michael J- Jacuzar Jacuzer. Uh, posted a uh, armor or equipment tier list a while ago, and he said Good Time Chapeau was like an A tier per piece of like class constructed equipment. Why? Well, I think. Well, first, I think that Balance of Justice and Crown of Province are also probably A tier, so it's got some stiff competition. But the fact that you have a three block hat that's getting like recursive value, this is converting a gold into potentially three tokens and those three tokens three tokens right you get a might of vigor and is it just a might of vigor it's just two tokens yeah it's two tokens but it also turns on your betsy ability on demand i think the equipment is quite powerful you have to have but the gold. betsy ability sucks does it it's turning two re- did you really just ask me that didn't we rant on this podcast for two years that the bravo ability sucks and betsy's yeah. ability is just strictly worse I don't think it's strictly worse. Getting one power makes it a lot better. That's like, I think two resources on average are worth two value, maybe a little bit more in class constructed, but like getting, that's like a, if your two resources are normally converting into zero damage versus converting into one damage, that's like an infinite percent increase, right? But it's, another way to look at it is grasp of the arc, grasp of the arc knight. What's the grasp that taps to, or costs Yeah, grasp of the arc knight, yeah. Yeah, grasp of the arc knight. You can spend two extra resources to get one damage, which while it's a bad rate, it is nice to have that option. And I would say Betsy's hero power is probably better than that split damage. A lot of the time, the overpower is worth something. Not all the time, but it's definitely weak compared to most of the hero powers in the game. But I think it's probably on par better than Bravo's. That's wild. That's really wild to me that you would say that. I think this is also just because I think overpower is just such a bad keyword ability. Yeah, it it feels like it's really designed for limited where these block cards are prevalent. And I think that's similar to like Spider's Bite and all the Assassin's Weapons. Like there's so many like powerful card types that are playable and constructed that having these things that play really nicely in a limited format are great for the limited format, but they don't seem generally appropriately statted for constructed and Betsy's really missing, really missing a power card. Like bet big is a lot weaker than the best cards of the other heroes. Like it's weaker than crippling crush. It's weaker than test of strength or trounce and Victor. 
And because of that, I think Betsy's kind of like really bad compared to the other guardians. But and and her hero power is also like it is designed for limited. I think it was good for the limited format and and limited Betsy was a lot better than Victor. He played Betsy much more often than Victor. Right. And I guess something that's also getting glossed over here, I feel like, is you need a gold to sacrifice to activate Chapeau. And like that, that's not nothing, right? Like that gold could have been a resource. Like generating that gold is in and of itself a resource, a cost. So usually you're having to put other cards in your deck to generate this resource. So it just seems like you're telling me that you that this three block piece of temper equipment is really good because if you generate this alternative resource sometimes you can pay two resources to get one damage and i'm just like this juice just doesn't seem worth the squeeze to me so it's not just that you pay two resources to get one damage it's that you play an attack they don't like you you just get to add an on hit to an attack if you have a gold you can turn your like if the gold just converts to a might and a vigor without the wager thing that'd be great if the hat just let you t- use a gold to spend two resources for plus one power, that's probably still better than sacrificing the gold to draw a card most of the time. And the fact that you're kind of getting both is is nice. I think the gold generation that Betsy has access to, it's pretty bad. Yeah, I was about to say, like, how are we making this gold to begin with? Does Bet Big create a gold? I think so, yes. So, so that's probably how you're getting the gold most of the time, is you're betting big with wagering a might, vigor, and gold. I, I do think I do think Betsy is in a very bad spot, and that's partly because her cards are so weak, but I don't think Chapeau is like compare Chapeau to Knucklehead, it's like way, way, way better, right? I think Chapeau is like No, Knucklehead gives you six intelligence. That's broken. I think I think Chapeau is statted appropriately for constructed, and if Betsy is a constructed hero, I assume that she will have Chapeau in her deck most of the time. Okay, that's fair. I still don't see it, but I feel less strongly about my opinion. So I'm more okay with my opinion being wrong here, if that's the case. You wanna? So you wanna talk about the other headpiece that recently came out that I was uh, wildly wrong on? Is it Balance of Justice? It was Balance of Justice. I thought this card was unplayable when it first came out, dude. I thought this card was so bad. I remember your your comments about it spawned a meme in our in our Wolf Pack Discord where you said it was just worse than Crown of Providence. Because yeah, dude. Crown of Providence, you get rid of a card to get a new card. And this one, you just your opponent has to draw two and then you get a new card. But you don't lose a card when you activate it to get a new card. It's just a like you get a free extra card. That's if a card is worth three value on defense, then it's like a five block hat, which is great. And a lot of the time, an extra card can be worth more than three because you use it on it. You can use it on a turn where your hand's like pretty mopey, and the card that you draw can make your bad hand really good, similar to Crown of Providence filtering. Or you can use it to have a play a six card hand at your opponent where you they draw their two cards, they hit you. You're like, okay, take twenty, whatever. Here's my turn, six card hand, boom, and like you're a hero that like gets a lot of value from playing additional cards in the same turn. Yeah, I just didn't think there would be enough spots or decks on the meta to work justify its cost. And I don't know that that will always be the case, but you know, I'm happy to be wrong on something. Uh, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm willing to bite the bullet and say, you know what, I'm wrong on something. And you know what, I was wrong on Balance of Justice. Yeah. Card sweet. It, I like it. Yeah, it's, it's really strong. You get to use the two block whenever it's relevant to stop a break point, and then you can cash in for an extra card any turn your opponent draws to, which happens a lot in the current class constructed format. Dromai with Tome, KO with Blood Rush Bellows, and even sometimes you just like go like Wild Ride into Claw into Bear Fangs or something, and it turns on the hat. Yeah, or, ninjas with Art of War. Yeah, ninjas have Art of War. Even Prism has her special draw to Angel. Yeah, and Tome of Divinity if she's running that. Yep. So... There's just a lot of opportunities to cash the hat in for an extra card. And anytime your piece of equipment blocks two and gets you a card of value, that, that's a great deal. That's a great piece of equipment. Yeah, that's fair. Well, I'm glad it's good. 
do you think like it's the ceiling on what we'll see on generic headpieces then or do you think they'll keep doing more powerful things in niche spaces overall so there's kind of an interesting situation with the generic hats where they want like i guess for a long time the calling prizes have been hats or a lot of their prize cards have been hats we had skull cap as the i think it was a battle hardened prize with skull cap because it was a battle hardened prize when tunics were the calling prizes but then they they did crown of providence as the calling hat and balance of justice as a calling hat so if they want to keep the trend of having the first place calling prizes be a legendary hat they'll have to make a new hat but it wouldn't surprise me if we just get like a really strong legendary shoes or gloves since we're still missing those that and they make those uh the prize cards for callings i don't even remember what the name of the legendary arms are that's vambrace of determination i believe yeah that's right because we played it at, at uh pro tour baltimore that that's right it is vambrace of determination but that card's not very good especially now the crown of seas is banned and class constructed <laughs> yeah uh it, it's okay against prism i guess ward maybe the new illusionist will be a ward hero yeah how do you feel about crown of seeds being banned out of class constructed so i think this is a piece of equipment that's people overrated for so long i think it is good it's probably one of the top 10 equipments in the game but it's never actually generating you value on a numbers perspective because you're trading one resource for one damage. That means a blue, if you're able to spend all three resources on defense, then you're getting three points of value out of it by using the crown. It's really nice that it's flexible. It's nice that it lets you convert your arsenal into a blocking card on turns when you need to, especially if you can combine it with either tunic to not have to pitch a whole card to do it, or things that cost one resource on one or two resources on defense, like Rampart or the Ram's Head, or Brothers in Arms was very common, and Oasis Respite was also very commonly paired with Crown of Seeds. And even peace of mind for like a hot minute before Oldham rotated. Yeah, and like yeah, the hard that's fatigue. True. There was like yeah. there was like one one off copies of Peace of Mind a lot of the time in the Oldham decks that I forgot about. Yeah, staunch response was also really common. Yeah, staunch. Yep. So, I I do think it was a powerful piece of equipment. It's. It's interesting that they said that it, I think I think they said it limited like Earth Hero design in their article. I'm trying to remember exactly what they said, but a big part of why the Briar deck was able to go so fatiguey with these Crown of Seeds was that all of its generic three for seven attacks and three uh, random three block attacks threatened to create an embodiment of Earth, which just let the Briar deck block very very well. And when they were left with extra cards, they could. They always had a meaningful on hit. Similar to Oldheim with Winter's Whale, the deck blocked very well, had Crown of Seeds, and then always had access to a meaningful on hit when your opponent left you with extra cards. Or I shouldn't say always for Oldheim because sometimes you didn't have an ice card, but with Winter's Whale specifically, you had an ice card a lot of the time. You just always you just frequently had access to a disruptive on hit. So that's kind of why it was so powerful in these Earth Heroes, these defensive Earth Heroes. They both blocked very well, and they had they both had on hits on hits plus good blocking abilities so true yeah they didn't say specifically uh well i guess like the gist of what they said is uh it is not beneficial for us to be forced to shape the future of earth heroes around the existence of crown of seeds yeah the the thing i'm most excited about this is when we saw the berserk ban it was like two weeks later we saw the ko deck had a card that was gonna break open the berserk was be broken with berserk so i think the thing that i'm most excited about is the fact that they're banning this and looking at this means they're probably working on a, a set with earth heroes in it or a earth hero in it at least and i am very much looking forward to getting to play some some ice cards and earth probably means ice is coming back yeah there's not a single a way weeks. to play the elemental heroes and class constructed at the moment they're all gone yeah all four of them living legend and and a lot, a lot of their cards are banned also. So, Hypothermia. I guess it's not banned in Class Constructed, but is, is Amid of Ice unbanned now in Class no, Constructed? No, or I don't, I don't think it was suspended until Icelander leaves. I think they just banned it because I believe you couldn't play it. No, Icelander Living Legend after Lexi. I don't think it got unbanned, but I'm not sure. 
Following cards are banned in Classic Constructed. Awakening, Ball Lightning, Belittle, Berserk, Bloodsheath Skeletta, Crown of Seeds, Drone of Brutality, Dusk Blade, Plunder Run, Stabby Hammerers. So, yeah, we, right, Amulet of Ice is free. Ice is back. It's free. We'll see. Maybe we'll get another Ice Wizard that can take advantage of it. That's a little bit weaker than Icelander was. What are you doing for, like, the next week? Um, That's a very, a very vague question i am probably you should let's cancel all of our plans for the next week and do this hundred game challenge or whatever of dusk blade is not is too good for class constructed because i don't believe that it's too good for class constructed but apparently brian gottlieb says it's on podcasts and all this stuff too if you say dusk blades because okay for class constructed you have to play 100 games of various matches into dusk blade heroes and you know what i'm willing to bite that bullet but do you want to take a whole week out of your life to test whether or not Duskblade is too good in class constructed? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm shocked. I do not. I got a I got an Alpha Clash tournament coming up I'm trying to test for, you know? Mm. So you're saying that the potential upside of having these results that nobody will even care about anyways is not worth it as opposed to a tangible benefit to your life? Yeah, yeah. I also think if I'm trying to break something, I'd also rather be testing sorcery stuff. I have been having fun with sorcery. Yeah, those are Arthurian was... legend cards, man. They're they're really cool. <laughs> yeah, which which ones are your favorite? <laughs> Let me tell you, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I think Duskblade would be fine. Maybe they think it might be too good in the future, but you know what? It doesn't even see play in Living Legend format. Whatever. Is that true? Do none of the chain decks play it? They don't sideboard it or anything? I, I don't know. Uh, let me look at Michael Fung's first place. I, 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 when I was watching him play, he had Rosetta Thorn as his piece of equipment. Oh, he was playing cha- against Chains and Lexis. So <laughs> I would yeah. play the aggro race card. Yeah. Is 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 Living Legend going to get uh, less uh, hyper-aggressive and more fatigue anytime soon? I don't think so. So Duskblade's oh. never seen play in that format. <laughs> we will... We'll see, I guess. I don't know. But I do think that... Yeah, no, no Duskblade in, in my list. Both Viscerai and Vincent are right now kind of struggling in Class Constructed. Like, we saw a little bit of Viscerai at the Pro Tour, but not a lot. And I saw too much Viscerai at the Pro Tour. <laughs> not, not a lot, and he didn't do particularly well. Vincent, I think we saw zero maybe one or two vincents but i i didn't see any of them at least i don't know what was in the meta break i think there was maybe one vincent at the pro tour but yeah there were six i know there were six viscerai because i am lamenting still to this day that i got paired into one of the six viscerai and of the six viscerai only like two or three of them were like not the otk version so like i got paired into a subset of a subset into a subset to be leveled on the you know it's i'm just the unluckiest person in the world michael you know it's fine yeah yep yep the unluckiest person in the world but uh, I, I do think Duskblade is a card that is problematic if we're trying to play really long, non-disruptive mid-range numbers games. But I don't think that many decks should be trying to do that. And Runeblades are in a bad enough spot currently that I would not be upset if they were like, we're going to try unbanning it. And if there's problems, we'll just ban it again. Because it's... It's never been legal in class constructed, right? Ever? No. It was the we made a mistake card. Yeah. And then Warmonger's Diplomacy is very, very good against that card. You literally just lose all your counters and turn after they play Warmonger's Diplomacy, no matter what. Yeah. I, so yeah, I, don't know. I I think it could be fine. I think if it does get unbanned. Warmongers might creep back up a little bit, but it also might creep back up a little bit after Brody won a calling with Azalea, who is also fairly vulnerable to Warmongers diplomacy. True. Yeah, very so, true. I don't know. I I suspect it would be fine. It might be one of the things where like, what's the upside? Like Drone of Brutality. It's probably not a problematic card. If it was legal, it probably wouldn't break anything. People it probably wouldn't see much play. But what's the upside of unbanning it? It's either going to be bad or it's going to lead to some pretty unfun game states fair okay all right i guess i don't feel that strongly about it but 
just strongly enough to, to put a week of my time and life energy into it, figuring out whether it's too good. I just yeah. care that much. Maybe maybe you'll find somebody else that'll that'll play a hundred games with you, but I'm I'm not doing it. Mm. That's why I need. If only Austin was a little bit older, I could do this testing with him. In a couple of years, <laughs> Ooh, right, buddy, Austin. I'm going to have the ultimate testing, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to figure out whether or not Dusk Blade's too good. You got to play your non-attack, and then your attack, and then you attack with the sword, and then you put a counter on it, and then you keep doing that, and it'll get real big. It'll be like, Dad, I want to go to the park. What are we doing here? I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say, outside's for losers, Austin. You sit down and you play with your piece of cardboard like a big boy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, I probably won't say that. Uh, okay, so so we got some combo equipment here, and then also on that ban list, there's a little card called Blood Sheath Skeletta. Do you think that card should be unbanned? Um, no, no, I do not. <laughs> I I think specifically in combination with X spells, both both Sonatas are X spells now. I think the the one. The one that goes and searches your deck for an aura, it wouldn't be problematic with because that one's already discounted by having rune chance. But sure. the the Sonata that reveals the top X cards Arcanics. in your deck, X plus three, yeah, Arcanics. That card with Skeleta is it's real good. Yeah, yeah, really good. Because normally if a hero has 20 resources in Flush and Blood, well, you can't spend 20 resources. Who can spend 20 resources? But this card just says... You're going to deal a million arcane damage if you got 20 resources and at draw like 10 cards. Unless I cast it and then you Sonata for like 10, reveal your top 10, 10 cards of your deck and draw like two cards. That was the most often way I was using uh, Blood Sheath Skeletta. So I think it's perfectly reasonable. As long as you are the unluckiest person in the world like me, it's a fine card. Well, well that's why you cut all the D-Reacts and added some more... Uh... And I did. Abilities. Yeah, dude, I did all the math and it still didn't math right. So that's, you know, oh well. Yeah. But uh, basically, combo equipment is equipment that maybe it has block value, maybe it doesn't, but it basically sits there until you're ready to do some something that's basically bigger than some of its parts. So, Sonata plus Blood Sheet Skeleta, for those of you that were not around, was a combo in Viscerai where you built, you sat there building a bunch of rune chants and then you sacked your Blood Sheet Skeleta to reduce the cost of your Sonata by an amount equal to the number of rune chance you have, which was usually 20 to 30. And because it was an X spell, you just got to sink all those resources or you got to declare the cost of Sonata that you wanted to pay, which would be um, you want to spend 30 resources on it or X equals 15 because it was an XX cost. And it was a really, really powerful combination that frequently resulted in the Viscerite either winning the game that turn or stripping the opponent's entire hand and putting them at an extremely low life total, which in combination with Rune Chance and Rosetta Thorn, it was really difficult to block out Viscerai when you got low like that. True. So, is Courage of Bladehold now uh, like a combo piece of equipment, would you say? Yeah, I think so. Even in Dorinthia, where it's like usually only paying for two or three sword swings, it's basically letting you save a card to do something stronger than the sum of its parts. In Dorinthia, you were frequently using it with Steel Blade. Steel Blade Supremacy and or Glistening Steel Blade and or Twinning Blade to go three attacks wide with very meaningful on hits on all of them and getting to keep basically your full five card hand plus having that paying for your sword swings um, leads to some really powerful turns that are bigger than you can normally get. And when you're playing a multiplier like Glistening Steel Blade or Steel Blade Supremacy, you're getting more than just the value of the one resource because all of your attacks are worth more, basically. Does that make sense? And then in Bolton specifically, you know, Bolton's got his old Lumina Ascension combination of cards where he charges and then he plays two or three Lumina Ascensions. And after sacking his Courage of Bladehold, he gets to attack six to eight times with his swords without paying for them. And that's huge. That's so many attacks usually results in like 40 plus value point swing and often wins you the game on the spot. Checks out. I've, I have done that once or twice before in my life, I think. You've triple lumen at me. A double lumen at me a million times. Well, double lumen is easy. You, you sneeze. You still get six two. swings. That's still getting yeah. six resources out of your chest, which is 
That's a combo. Sure. So would you say that Breeze Rider boots are a combo piece of equipment? <laughs> because they sacrifice to give your combo cards go again. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. They, they can be, because if you're giving go again to multiple attacks, I would say that you're getting some good value out of it. It leads to the 30 damage Katsu turns where they play like three Bonds of Ancestry, where they go like Bonds Whelming, Bonds Whelming, Bonds Whelming, Dishonor or something. <laughs> or I missed the Bonds in there, but... Yeah, you can you can definitely use it to combo, use them to combo. Um, they can also just be like kind of like Snapdragon Scalers, we're just converting them to get one extra action point, which is not using them for their highest possible point. But that's I guess that's one of the strong parts about a lot of these combo equipment is you can just use them for kind of their I don't want to say their intended value, but kind of like a a lower value. Mopier value, yeah. yeah break in case of emergency yeah so jumping all the way back we talked about how there's the blocking equipment combo equipment and resource equipment and then basically specifically chest pieces are supposed to be the piece of equipment that generate resources and then arms are supposed to generate like damage valuations but i just had a thought that then rune blade equipment that generate rune chance breaks that dynamic since rune since there are so many cards that are reduced by cost because of rune chance so then their arms that create rune chance specifically grasp of the arc knight functions as like a resource generating card which is i i guess i never really even thought about it like that before yeah i i think you can kind of look at it like that but rune chance at their core like Yes, there's a lot of cards that synergize, but they are just one arcane damage. And I think it's similar to like how might tokens are an arms thing and arms make might, might is damage. But you look at Prime to Fight, it's a card that costs less. Or no, I guess it just gets more damage if you had a might token. Yeah, it's bigger that reduces the cost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know where I was going with that. (laughs) It's okay. So yeah, just a little interesting thing that popped in my head and... I don't know. For a long time, we said Grasp of the Arc Knight was like the best equipment, if not one of the best pieces of equipment in the game. Uh, do you still think that's true? And it's just the supporting pieces around Room Blade? Or do you think Power Creep has kind of caught up with the times with good old Grasp? Yeah, I actually think it's just a Power Creep situation where it was one of the best equipment in the game. Um, and a big part of that was there just wasn't another arms that's like remotely comparable to how good grasp of the arc knight was it was a three block that also let you convert excess resources into more damage which is really really strong it let you filter on turn zero just was worth more than three value per game on an arm slot and there is i don't think there's another arms in the game that could do that i think in, in that same conversation i think scabs and others was one of the best equipments in the game because it's a boot that boots that blocked three and it, it's worth more than three points of value because if you have this roll ability that is worth something, you know. But now we have other arms. We have Apex Bonebreaker, I think, might be the best arms in the game now where they're usually getting five points of value off of them. Um, I think there might be an argument for Courage the, uh, of Blade Hold or Iron Song versus maybe. Cur- Courage of Blade Hold's the chest. It's uh, Brave Forge uh, Bracers. Brave Forge Bracers, yeah, yep. yeah, thank you. I think. Brave Forge Bracers and Iron Song Versus both require you to hit to get a value, but they spend one resource for one point of value. And a lot of the time in Warrior, you're just going to have an extra resource lying around because you you, you have a lot of one cost and two cost in Warrior. Maybe not a lot it's, of two costs. But. And specifically, like the filtering off of Iron Song Versus isn't, isn't nothing either. There's a lot of ways that you can start setting up pitch stacks or... Uh, certain things in like combo situations in Bolton specifically that are really nice that are enabled by Iron Song versus. So that's an element to it too, as well. Yeah, I think it is fair to say that it's just, it's worth three. It's worth three plus some in the same way Grasp is worth three plus some, but it's not like you can't, you can't just like assign a flat value to it because it's like contextual on your hands. How many times it comes up that you can't convert your extra resource into something. So Scowling Fleshbag, we said we'd come back to it. Talk to me about Scowling Fleshbag. Yeah. So Scowling Fleshbag is in an interesting spot where it's the only disruptive equipment in legal and class constructed right now. 
Uh, the stalagmite is the only other one that has been legal that I know of. At least there are some equipment that can be disruptive when paired with specific other cards. For example, Halo of Illumination paired with Prism's Hero Power can go get you a Figment of Triumph that reduces your opponent's attacks by one, and that is disruption. But it doesn't actually, like, I, I wouldn't attribute that disruption to the equipment. I would attribute to the hero or the cards played with the equipment. Whereas Scowling Flashback, you just play it, or you just block with it, and it intimidates your opponent. And um, it's basically, it and Slagmite are equipment that on their own aren't worth a ton, but if you can line up your disruption in a way that makes it so your opponent can't spend their hand in a way that they would have been able to, you can basically take away a lot of value from them. I think the most common thing that I'm looking for in KO mirrors is if my opponent has one resource and two cards in hand when they're attacking me with something with go again, if you scaling flashback them and they don't have a way to generate extra resources like a tunic counter or heart and cross trap, there's basically no card left in the deck that if they're left over with scaling flashback, they'll be able to attack with. And so if you intimidate one of their cards, they're almost certainly going to waste their action point, waste their one floating resource, arsenal a card, and take an intellect penalty of one because they only get to draw three cards. Sometimes they can discard a windup, I guess. That's probably the best case scenario for them, but they're still wasting their action point and wasting their one floating resource. Yeah, and they're only getting one value out of that because they probably discarded from somewhere else on the turn cycle yeah. prior to that. Yeah, maybe they're getting two value, but even then, even still, it's... Not good. Yeah, yeah, really good when you do that. Okay. Yeah, uh, so Scowling Fleshbag is part of the reason why I wanted to go hybrid as well. I think the matchup's fine for Sabres, but I think things can kind of go sideways on you a little bit easier, and you just have to play the game a little bit differently. But the problem with Scowling Fleshbag when you're playing Sabres is that you have a big sign on your forehead that says, use Fleshbag now because <laughs> I have a combo. I just shrugged and said no blocks and took a bunch of damage on your previous turn cycle. It is now the correct time for you to use Scowling Fleshbag to get a lot of value out of my hand. Or you have to just like be like, oh, well, I hope they don't get the card like you have could have like a combo piece and just some other random card and you're like i hope i take win my 50 50 coin flip to win the <laughs> game here and that's not really fun yeah so um what i like about raiden is that when you play raiden there's lots of times where it's just like oh what do you have one card left in your hand okay no blocks and you're like okay well th now my last card was a lumina ascension uh raiden swing raiden swing and you could have gotten a lot of value had you known that the last card in my hand was lumina ascension but since it's a lot more disguised and there's a lot more nuance to the game plan of what we're doing. It just is a lot harder. Like there's been games against uh brood opponents where they don't even use scaling flesh bag until they're sub like 15 health. And then at that point they're just using it to stay alive just because there wasn't an obvious spot to use it before then in the game. So yeah, that's, Sometimes. that's, that's definitely one of the strengths of Raiden is it's really hard to know when you're supposed to scaling flashback them. I think the most obvious one is when you play a via the Vanguard and charge one or two cards. You're like, oh, every card is worth more. This is a good turn to scaling flashback. <laughs> True, yeah. But other than that, there's just like no clear signs that it's like you should scaling. And even then, I have an interesting decision then as well, because if I want to, I can just charge that extra card and not allow you to get the extra value. And then I just have the extra card. Like if I know I'm going to have a card left over or... It's not a card I particularly want to arsenal. As long as it's a light card, I can just tuck it and just get my two points of damage anyways out of it. So mm -hmm. Two points of damage and a card and soul for later. Yeah. yeah. I do think with your Lumina Ascension example earlier, if you don't have any floating resources and you just like attack with, let's say you attack with, I don't know. Um, Engulfing Light or Classic. Yeah, sure. Engulfing Light and it's pumped up because you had a Courage or something. I don't know. Or has Go again because... Agility well, token, the, yeah. I think it, having it being pumped up is more relevant than it having go again. But if it's already pumped up, so you can give it go again, and you have one card in hand, and I use scaling flashback or like here you just scaling flashback, then you're just like, okay, I won't give it go again. I'll just save the card in my soul, and then you get an arsenal the lumina ascension to it later. Yeah. So. And sometimes you have spirit of arena in play, and scaling flashback doesn't oh, sure. even do anything anyway. So. Yeah. So cool. Spirit is very good against. Scaling flashback that also yeah. came up testing against Zach's Viscerite deck, where I would try to scaling flashback him and he'd creepers his non attack in. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's cute. <laughs> I 
and since we're good against flush bag. Okay. Any other equipment dynamics you want to talk about? Gosh, I think there's a lot of interesting things to dive in on equipment and we covered a lot of it, but I feel like we could talk about equipment for like, yeah, we scratched like the surface. Hours. We, we yeah. could probably just spend the next two or three hours discussing like, that's why I was like, we can't do an equipment tier list because we'd be here for like three hours at this point. There's just so much equipment in the game and so much is like contextual as well. So yeah. yeah. I think like spending a lot of time figuring out how to maximize the value of your equipment is a huge way to get like a lot of equity in games. Like equipment swings things so much the difference between blocking with a scaling flesh bag for two when you're about to die or for two and intimidating a very relevant card and making your opponent either end a lock penalty or have a significantly weaker turn that's that's huge i know talking to michael fung his camera match that he played against the katsu he lost he he looked back at that game and he's like i think i scaling flesh bagged in the wrong time and i i actually watching it i'm not sure if i agree with that but i know that was like one of his takeaways and like if you use it use your equipment at the right time and it lines up sorry if you use your equipment at the right time that's like a ton of equity and if you're losing games definitely look back at how you're using your equipment and see if there's any way you could have gotten more value out of it if you used it at a different time yeah absolutely and i think it's they're the most skill testing cards in flesh and blood since they're so they're just always there you start the game with them in play and knowing what time to use them sometimes it's correct as just like block on like turn zero or turn one even um with your equipment and sometimes it's right to never block with your equipment basically at all until you're at sub 10 life or whatever to the very end of the end game it just it's dependent on matchup what your plan is what you're using that equipment for in the matchup there's just so much nuance to that like evaluation that it's hard to cover it all in just one hour so but i'm glad we did talk about what we did and covered the pieces of equipment that we did but i guess with that being said the next time you're rolling your scapskin leathers sure we already do scapskin leathers sign off do we do a uh, scapskin leather sign off i think that was in the episode that we didn't air because i talked about scapskins for like 10 minutes in that one just be safe, I'll mix it up. The next time you're getting intimidated by scowling flashback, always remember, mind your manners. <laughs> <laughs>